All right. Well, good morning, Rhythm Church. How are we doing this morning? Excellent. That was not bad, given that it's uh, kind of a rainy day. Well, I'm glad you guys are here. Uh, I'm excited to dive into the Word with you. Uh, But we're going to start with something a little bit different. I need everyone in here to raise your hand in the air. Just just one hand. Everyone raise your hand in the air. What I want to do is I want to find the tallest person in this room. Okay, so here's how this is going to work. I am going to name a height, and if you are that tall or taller, then you can keep your hand in the air. If you are not, then you will put your hand down. No shame, all right? It's all good. You can't control your height anyway, right? So I want to see who the tallest person in this room is. We're going to start low. We're going to start low, okay? Uh, We are going to start with five foot or taller. Five foot or taller, keep your hand in the air. If you're under five foot, all good. Just got to drop that hand because you will not be the tallest person. All right, let's jump up. Uh, kind of a, a bigger jump here. Five, five. Five, five and up. Keep your hand in the air. Okay. What about five, eight and up? Ooh, that was a lot of hands went down right there. Okay, how about five, 11 and up? 5'11 and up. Okay, so we just have a few left, including my wife, who is taller than me. Um, we're going to jump it up to, to the six-foot range for those of you that think you're better than the rest of us. So six foot or taller, keep your hand in the air. Okay, we just have a few more. So we're going to go one at a time here. Six one or taller. Six two or taller. Six three or taller. Who are we rocking with? Is it? Okay. A couple more. Okay. Six, four or taller. You can't stand on a chair, Jason. That's not how height works. Jim, I think it's just you, right? Am I missing anybody? All right, Jim, go ahead and come up here, man. Everyone give it up for Jim. Okay, so, so here's what I want to do. I want to do a little comparison here. So you're, how tall are you? About 6'4". Four. 6'4". Six, four. Okay. I'm shrinking over my age, but I'm 6'4". Okay. Yeah, I'm shrinking in my old age, too. That's the problem. I used to be 6'3"-ish, <laughs> something like that. Um, so Jim being 6'4", if I'm, if I'm hanging out with Jim and we're talking, we're chatting, I feel pretty short. All right? I, I stand at a solid 5'9 and a half. And so when we're chatting... I certainly don't feel tall. Now, if we changed it up a bit, though, how about I get my good friend Mary Marshall to come up here? Mary, why don't you come up here? Come on down. Give it up for Mary, everyone. Mary, how tall are you, Mary? Well, um, I'm shrinking. Um, We all are. I think about 4'8 now. Okay, about 4'8 now. Okay, got it. So, Mary being 4'8. Now, I will say, do not let that... Uh, don't let that fool you because Mary is, every inch of her is power packed and ready to scrap. Okay. So even if I was six, eight, I'm like, I'm not, I'm not going against Mary. Um, so here's the thing though. If I stand next to Mary and me and Mary are talking, I feel pretty tall, right? I feel, I feel pretty good. I feel all five, nine and a half inches. But the interesting thing is, is my height doesn't change if I'm talking to Jim. I don't get shorter. My height doesn't change talking to Mary. I don't get taller. Rather, what happens is I am more aware of my height or lack thereof, depending on who I am being compared to. And I say this because we're going to look at a story in the book of Isaiah, chapter 6. We're going to see Isaiah in the presence of God. And the comparison between Isaiah and God is striking. Now, I don't want to spoil it all. So you guys can go and head back to your seats. Give it up for them one more time. So Isaiah chapter 6, we are going to look at verses 1 through 4 first, and then we're going to go a verse or two at a time up to verse 8. So let's start with verses 1 through 4. It says this, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a high and lofty throne, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphim were standing above him. They each had six wings. With two, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet, and with two, they flew. 
And one called to another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of armies. His glory fills the whole earth. The foundations of the doorways shook at the sound of their voices and the temple was filled with smoke. So in this passage, we see Isaiah, a prophet, standing in a place that he really has no right to be standing in. Because Isaiah in this moment is standing in the very throne room of God himself. And this would have been shocking because even on earth, if we're looking at the temple, which is where the Israelites worshipped, the deepest part of the temple was called the Holy of Holies, and, and that's where God's sort of special presence resided. And so even on earth, there were some strong stipulations. There was only one person who was the high priest who could go into that section of the temple, and even that person could only go once a year and after a series of rituals to cleanse themselves as much as possible. So to go into the presence of God in the Holy of Holies back then, Old Testament, would have kind of been a death wish. Because you're entering the very presence of God and you have not done the things that are proper to do to be in God's presence. So if that's the case on earth, how much more is it the case in heaven? where Isaiah has this vision where he is in God's throne room. He hasn't done any of the rituals. He's not the high priest. And so he's probably in that room seeing these things. His heart is racing. Maybe his knees are shaking a little bit because he's going, man, I don't know how I got here, and I should not be here in the presence of this perfect and holy God. Now, let's back up. I want to look at some of the sights that Isaiah saw. I want to tune our ears to some of the sounds that he heard because that'll help us understand this full experience and what exactly Isaiah encountered. So the first thing Isaiah sees in this vision is the throne. He sees God on his throne. It says that right at the beginning of verse 1. It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a high and lofty throne. Now, this is an interesting passage in general, but it's even more interesting when we put it in context and we kind of understand the significance behind this. Because King Uzziah uh, was the king of the southern kingdom of Judah, and he was the second longest reigning king in all of Judah's history. And for the most part, he was a great king. For the most part, he was solid. He was a godly king. God-fearing person made kind of a blunder towards the end of his life that was no bueno. But other than that, he was great. In addition to that, he was extremely successful. He was brilliant. And so if you are Israel, or if you're the, the people of Judah, then you feel comfortable with this guy on the throne. As long as Uzziah is there, you're, you're solid. Because this guy is accomplishing all sorts of things. He's brilliant. We've got nothing to worry about. And this is really important because at the same time that this is going on, that Uzziah is reigning, there are other nations that surround Israel that are building power and they're looking to enlarge their footprint. And Israel was actually a strategic place because many of the major trade routes went through Israel. So the other surrounding nations, they wanted to become sort of, you know, this Mecca superpower then they had to control or conquer Israel. And so when they get the news that their great and brilliant king Uzziah has died, they're afraid. That brings fear and, and anxiety because they don't know what the future holds. I mean, if these other nations are on the rise and, and they don't have that, that strong king on the throne, then they're in trouble. Which is why it's so interesting that the first thing that Isaiah sees is God on his throne. First thing he sees is God seated on his throne. It says a high and lofty throne. Other translations say high and lifted up. 
But the point is, is even when things on the ground level looked bad or uncertain at best, God was still on his throne. Yes, King Uzziah had died, and that was not great news for Judah, for the people of God, but God was still reigning. He was high and lifted up. See, that throne is not at eye level. It's not like, you know, Isaiah is coming in to level ground. No, he walks in and God is high and lifted up. He is over all things. He he is the sovereign king, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, who is over everything. And so when Isaiah sees this, he's taken in by it. He, He is stunned by this vision. Now, the throne isn't the only thing he sees, though. The next thing he sees is the hem. So the next part of the verse says, says, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Now, in the past, I have glossed over this because in my mind, I I was just thinking the robe filled the temple. But the interesting part is it's not talking about the whole. It's talking about the hem. It it is talking about the, the fringe of his robe. Filled the whole temple. I don't, we don't know how big the whole robe was. Just the hem of it filled the entire temple. And so with the sight of the throne and the hem, Isaiah encounters God's greatness. He encounters God's greatness in this moment. He realizes in that moment that God is so much greater than him. And he's so much bigger than anything that is going on on the ground Level, he encounters God's greatness. And he's rocked by it. He's in awe of it. But there's more. Look at what else he sees. He sees the throne, the hem, and now he sees the seraphim. And this is where things get uh, a little weird. It says, seraphim were standing above him. They each had six wings, not normal. With two, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet. With two, they flew. And these strange creatures were singing, calling out to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of armies. His glory fills the whole earth. And it says when they were singing, the foundations of the doorways shook at the sound of their voices, and the temple was filled with smoke. So Isaiah finds himself in the throne room of God, in the presence of God, He sees this high and lifted up throne. He sees this hem that is filling the whole temple. And now he sees these creatures that are straight out of Pan's Labyrinth or something like that. These crazy looking creatures. Now, let me me paint a fuller picture for you. We're going to cross-reference to a different text. Um, One, the word seraphim means burning ones. So we can assume that these creatures were either bright like fire or they were literally on fire. They have six wings. And if you look at Revelation 4, it gets even more interesting. Now, in Revelation 4, this is John talking. He doesn't explicitly call these the seraphim. Technically, the only place we see that word is Isaiah 6. But you can see some very strong similarities. Look at chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. It says, Four living creatures, covered with eyes in front and in back, were around the throne on each side. The first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature was like an ox. The third living creature had a face like a man. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings. They were covered with eyes around and inside. And day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, 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 Lord God the Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. So these creatures are bright like fire. They have six wings, eyes all over them, and they look something like animals and or humans. Normal stuff. Isaiah sees this, these terrific, terrifying creatures flying around the throne, and if that's not enough, Another one of his senses is engaged. He's mainly seen things so far, but now we see him hear things. It says that these creatures were singing, 
holy, holy, holy. And they were singing so loud that, that the place was shaking. And they're singing this on purpose. See, the word holy is, uh, we talked a little bit about it last week, but it's one of those words that kind of gets lost in translation. Because it's sort of turned into a Christianese word where we don't really know the meaning of it. We just kind of think it means like morally good. And sure, there's an aspect of that, but the word holy really means separate. It means to be other than. And so these creatures are singing holy, holy, holy because they are praising him, like we said last week, because there is no one like him. There is no one at all like him. And this threefold repetition is not just kind of a catchy tune. It's not a way to sort of get things going. This was a Hebrew way of emphasizing something. So when you said holy, 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 you were saying he is the holiest. And it's fascinating because there is only one characteristic of God that is used threefold like this, and that is his holiness. The Bible says a lot of things about God, a lot of characteristics about God. God is love. God is a merciful. God is just. But the only time we see this threefold repetition is in talking about God's holiness. Holiness was a pretty big deal in the Bible, also to Isaiah. He uses the phrase holy one to refer to God 30 times in the book of Isaiah. We see the word holy over 600 times in all of Scripture. And there's only two places where it's repeated in that threefold manner, and that's in Isaiah 6 and Revelation 4, which we just looked at. And so holiness is a big deal. God's otherness, his uniqueness, his separation from us in the sense that he is in a category of his own. He is perfect and good and pure in all of those things. He is holy. And that may be one of the most important characteristics about God. And if we understand Isaiah's emphasis on this, it helps make sense of the seraphim's reactions, or excuse me, the seraphim's actions and Isaiah's reaction. It, it kind of brings it all together. Because concerning seraphim's actions, if you look back at verse 3, it says they, they use two wings to fly, makes sense. But then they use the other four to hide, to cover themselves in the presence of God. And the reason these creatures did this is because they felt so unworthy in the presence of God that they literally had to hide themselves they had to shield themselves from God's glory because they felt so inferior and insignificant in comparison to the one that they were in the presence of. And these are angelic beings. They don't have any sin. They're called burning ones. So they're, they're bright like fire. And yet these burning ones that are bright like fire compared with the brightness of the glory of God feel dim and insignificant because God is just that much more holy, that much more separate from anything else that he has created. The brightest thing that we can picture would be the sun. Simplest terms, it's a ball of fire. And yet, if we were to place the sun next to the Lord the sun would look dark in comparison because that's how bright his glory and his holiness are. And so you can imagine if the seraphim felt unworthy, how much more did Isaiah feel in that moment? Because in this moment, Isaiah encounters God's holiness. And I say encounters for a reason because this is not just an intellectual ascent. This is not just sort of an emotional experience, so to speak. I mean, this is an all-consuming, every senses engaged encounter with the living God. And here's how Isaiah responds 
to these sights, sounds, and shakes. Verse 5. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined. Because I am a man of unclean lips and live among a people of unclean lips. And because my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of armies. Isaiah doesn't respond at first with worship or gratitude. The first thing he does is he responds with terror. With despair. Because he thinks, woe is me. I'm ruined. I'm a goner. Me being the sinful person in the presence of God, I'm, I'm in trouble here. See, in light of God's greatness, his holiness, Isaiah sees his smallness and sinfulness. It becomes clearer to him in that moment. And hear me, Isaiah, he, he was a prophet. He was a courageous prophet. He was an obedient prophet. He was a godly man. At least back on the streets of Judah he was. But in the presence of God, he felt entirely unworthy to be in God's presence. And it's interesting because Isaiah is actually not the only one that responds this way when they encounter God. I mentioned John's revelation earlier. His description of what were probably the seraphim as well. And that was in chapter 4. But if you back up to chapter 1, when John first sees God, we see a similar reaction. Revelation chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. It says, Then I turned to see whose voice it was that spoke to me. When I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was one like the Son of Man, dressed in a robe and with a golden sash wrapped around his chest. The hair of his head was white as wool, white as snow, and his eyes like a fiery flame. His feet were like fine bronze as is fired in a furnace, and his voice like the sound of cascading waterfalls. He had seven stars in his right hand. A sharp double-edged sword came from his mouth, and his face was shining like the sun at full strength. Look at this. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. Wow. What about Daniel, prophet Daniel? He has a vision that's similar to Isaiah, but extremely similar to John. Daniel 10, verses 4 through 9, says, On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, the Tigris, I looked up, and there was a man dressed in linen with a belt of gold from Euphaz around his waist. His body was like beryl. His face was like the brilliance of lightning. His eyes like flaming torches. His arms and feet like the gleam of polished bronze, and the sound of his words, like the sound of a multitude. I was left alone looking at this great vision. No strength was left in me. My face grew deathly pale, and I was powerless. I heard the words he said, and when I heard them, I fell into a deep sleep with my face to the ground. All of these men, great men of God, Love the Lord, follow the Lord. When they saw God, they all felt despair. They all felt, woe is me, at first. Because again, in light of God's holiness, they all realized that there was nothing they could do to bridge that gap between them and God. And this is important. This is an important facet of who God is. Because if we understand God's holiness and greatness, then it makes his grace and kindness that much sweeter. When we understand how great and awesome and and infinitely other than us he is, then it makes his grace so sweet. And so we need to take these images of God and log them into our hearts and allow them to change us and allow them to help us see God differently. Because if we skip these images, our worship will be stunted because God's grace will be smaller. 
But if we understand these things, then it helps his grace be so much bigger. In fact, that's what we're going to see next. See, Isaiah's vision starts in despair. He goes, woe is me. But it does not end there. It does not end there at all. Because after it's all said and done, he's going to encounter one more characteristic of God. And it's a characteristic that really rounds out this complete vision of God. Look at verses 6 through 7. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, And in his hand was a glowing coal that he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your iniquity is removed and your sin is atoned for. Isaiah has encountered God's greatness. He has encountered God's glory. And now in this moment, Isaiah encounters God's grace. He encounters God's grace. And I would imagine that This was a sweet relief to Isaiah. I would imagine that his shoulders probably dropped a little bit, right? His lungs started to fill with air again. He may have stumbled just at the thought of, wow, what just happened? I thought thought a moment ago I was a goner, but but now what? My sins atoned for? I mean, he probably felt completely unworthy of it, and yet he had just received the biggest amount of grace that you can He thought he was a goner, but in a moment it says that his sins were atoned for. His iniquity was removed, and now he can enjoy the presence of God. And you know what the best part about this is? Isaiah didn't do anything. He just stood there, and God did all the work. Isaiah was was paralyzed in this spot in fear of how great and holy God was. And he knew that there was nothing he could do to bridge the gap. He knew that in comparison to God's holiness, he was, he was a goner. I mean, he might as well have tried to jump the Grand Canyon with two broken ankles. There was no way he was going to bridge that gap. And so God said, all right, then I'm going to bridge that gap. And the seraphim grabs a pair of tongs, picks up a burning coal, flies over to Isaiah, and he presses the coal to his lips, which thankfully this is a vision, because that would hurt in real life. But the coal doesn't destroy him, doesn't destroy his lips, it purifies his lips. Now it could be that maybe the seraphim pressed the coal against his lips because he was going to be a prophet, and he's going to have to speak for God. Or it could be that the mouth or the lips or the tongue or whatever was sort of symbolic for the entire person. A few weeks ago, we looked at a little bit from James chapter 3. And James said this about the tongue. He said, it stains the whole body, sets the course of life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. James does not mince words. But he says it stains the whole body. And so in some sense, you could look at this and say, well, Maybe the seraphim is putting this coal on Isaiah's lips because he's saying, I am completely cleansing you. Every part of you is atoned for. Every part of you is made completely new in this moment. He says, I've taken away your sin. And again, this is why I say that our perspective of God's greatness and holiness matter because they make his grace all the sweeter because think about it this this god with eyes like fire sword coming from his mouth completely holy he didn't have to do this i mean he could have burned us up in an instant he could have taken us out in an instant but that's not the heart of the god that we serve he said no i'm not going to consume you I'm going to purify you. And this is just a picture of ultimately what Jesus did. Because Jesus stepped off of his high and lofty throne, stepped down into our human world with our mess and everything, and he went to the cross 
where he took our punishment on himself so that we could be made pure. So that we could be in the presence of God. And so if we move past God's holiness too quick, then we, we miss his goodness. If we move past the depth of our sin too quick, we miss his grace. Because if my sin is only an inch deep, then God's grace only has to be a little bit more than that. But if my sin is total, if it is all-consuming, if there is no escape, then that means God's grace has to be massive. His grace has to cover everything, more so than our sin. His grace has to be even bigger than our sin. And our sin's pretty big, which means God's grace is gargantuan. And that's the grace that we stand in because of Jesus. That's the grace that we get to live our lives in light of because of what Jesus did. See, for as much as Isaiah felt exposed and unworthy at the beginning of this encounter is the same level to which he feels loved and accepted after this encounter. In that moment, Isaiah feels love in every fiber of his being because of God's powerful grace. And this grace changes Isaiah's life. This grace is the start of Isaiah's role as a prophet. And it's true for us when we encounter this kind of grace, it changes us. Look at this in verse 8. Isaiah responds to this whole thing. He says, Then I heard the voice of the Lord asking, Who will I send? Who will go for us? Isaiah said, Here I am. Send me. See, God's looking for a prophet in this moment to go to his wayward people. And without a second thought, Isaiah puts his resume in. See, the encounter that started with woe is me ends with send me. There's this process of woe is me, I recognize my sin, but worthy are you, God, because you can take away my sin. And now it's send me. Now that I've experienced this grace, use me. And God does. And and listen, Isaiah's mission was not an easy one. If you go look at Isaiah's mission, I mean, essentially God's like, hey, I'm going to send you to a people that aren't going to listen. And he's like, really? Like, that's kind of a bummer of a call. But Isaiah goes because he experienced God's grace and said, whatever you want, God, send me. See, when you come face to face with God's grace, his holiness, his greatness changes everything. It uproots your life. It changes the direction of your life. It supersedes your identity. It does everything. Everything changes by God's grace. And listen, if you've never experienced that grace, then you can do that today. See, the the beauty is if you right now feel like You see God's greatness, you see his holiness, but you are still sitting in despair thinking there's no way that I can bridge the gap. Well, there is a way. It's just not your way. It's God's way, and it's through Jesus. And so you don't have to sit in despair. You can delve into the depths of God's grace in Christ. And at that point, your life changes forever. Yes, God is still who he says he is. God's character doesn't change, but the covenant does. Because now we have a different relationship to this holy God. And so if you want to do that today, you've never done that, then you can call out to God right here. You can call out to God and and do that thing. The, The same process The three-step process of admitting sin, woe is me, of acknowledging grace, worthy are you, God, and then finally of saying, use me, God, send me. In fact, I'm going to have everyone in here bow your heads and close your eyes. And if you have never made that choice, but you want to today, 
You want to call out to God for his grace. You want to start a relationship with this gracious God who is so worthy. Then call out to him right now in your own words. Confess your sin. Acknowledge your need for grace. Acknowledge Christ as the Savior. Ask him to forgive you, to change you. And if that's you and you did that or you want to do that for the first time today, no one's looking around at you. It's between you and God. I want you to just slip up your hand in the air just as a way of saying, I am trusting Jesus for the very first time. And if you do that, then just keep that hand in the air high and proud and listen to me before you leave today. I'd love to chat with you. I'd love to talk to you about what this looks like, this, this following Jesus thing. I'll be at the Welcome Center. would love to connect with you because this is the greatest day of your life. And this moment, like for Isaiah, changes everything. You can put your hands down. God, we thank you for your grace. God, we thank you that there is no one like you. God, we thank you that, that when we said, woe is me, you came to deliver us and to save us. God, I pray that you would open up our hearts and our minds to, to glimpse and grasp your greatness. God, to feel and encounter your holiness. God, and to live in and be consumed by your grace every second of every day. But we don't deserve anything, but you are good and gracious, and you have given us the gift of salvation. You have given us the gift of friendship with you. You have given us the gift of eternal life. God, there is no one like you. We praise you for your holiness, for your goodness, for your mercy. God, I pray that we would walk in light of it. It's in Jesus' matchless name we pray. Amen.